Acts chapter 5, beginning in the very first verse, the Bible says, But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession, and kept back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part, and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said, Ananias, why hath Satan filled thine heart to lie to the Holy Ghost and to keep back part of the price of the land? Whilst it remained, was it not in thine own? And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power? Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Thou hast not lied unto men, but unto God. And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost, and great fear came upon all them that heard these things. And the young men arose and wound him up and carried him out and buried him. And it was about the space of three hours after when his wife, not knowing what was done, came in. And Peter answered unto her, Tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, Yea, for so much. Then Peter said unto her, How is it that you've agreed together to tempt the Spirit of the Lord? Behold, the feet of them that have buried thy husband are at the door, and they shall carry thee out. And she fell down straightway at his feet, and yielded up the ghost. And the young men came in and found her dead, carrying her forth, and buried her by her husband. Dear Lord, we thank you for your goodness and watch care. Lord, we thank, thank you for, for grace in your mighty hand. Lord, we thank you for the strength and your power and your mercy that's brought us this way uh, this morning. Lord God, we always would pray that we would not uh, take this as a little thing, but rather as the uh, power of your own hand and that we divine, we meet here by your divine power alone. Lord God, we pray that you would bless uh, your word to the hearts of the hearers, Lord, that you teach us some things, Lord, that you show us. We stand in need before you. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. I'm going to be preaching this morning the, uh, the impact of a spiritual lie. A spiritual lie. Now before we begin, I will say first of all that lying has become so commonplace in our nation that nobody really thinks anything about it. To tell a lie is almost, uh, well, it's just part of life these days. But lying has its outcomes. Lying ha is just as, just as sinful as any other sin. Lying is a difficulty. Now, uh, and you know, we want to we wanna justify it. If Donna comes to me and says, do you think this dress looks nice on me? How are you going to answer? Now, you'd like to say, well, what do you think about it? Get her opinion first, right? But if, it, if it's not attractive, if it's not, I mean, in, just be honest. Say, well, that ain't the favorite dress. That, you know, uh, I'd wear something else. But, you know, be honest. But, you know, when it comes to your wife, it's a little, uh, a little bit easier said than done. But is that not a lie? Sure it is. It, it, it is a lie to tell, uh, to tell the, uh, a truth that is not real. Uh, now, spiritual lies, uh, there's two people you lie to with a spiritual lie. You lie to God and you lie to yourself. That's a spiritual lie. And we lie, uh, we lie about service. We, we lie about what we're committed to do. We, we lie about our own spiritual condition. We lie and we lie and we lie. But I remind you, God knows the truth. He knows where you stand at. He knows the reality of the situation. Now back in our first verse, the Bible says, But a certain man. Now I want you to see first of all that Ananias was a real person. It's not a parable. It's not, uh, it's not just given for our learning, but it was an event that happened in the first century church. First Baptist Jerusalem had this in their own church. But a certain man named Ananias with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession. Now, 
There's nothing wrong with that. In the first century church, they lived as a commune. Now they did this, I believe, so that they could spend their time in prayer and study of what God would have them to do. The, uh, is it wrong to live in communes today? No. Uh, is it needful? No, it's not needful either. There's nothing wrong with it. If we decided to sell all our possessions and buy one big house, uh, there's no problem with that. But I will say this, probably it wouldn't go that well. And that is just the nature of man. But in this day, and in, in that day, in that time, that's what many were doing. So they had a piece of land, they had a parcel, they sold it off. And I want you to see in verse 2, and get back part of the price, his wife also being privy to it, and brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. Now, the next thing I want you to see is you better take marriage very seriously. These two were joined. The Bible says, and they twain shall be one flesh. And once you're married, you're hooked up from them for them on. I don't care about divorce. I don't care why you left. I don't care why you're going to leave. I don't care about any of that because divorce is nothing more than a statement of man. You know what divorce is? It's a type of a lie. Because God doesn't honor it. What does he say in Matthew's gospel? Because of your hardness of heart, I give you a, 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 a law of divorcement. But it was not so from the beginning. Right? And, and so we see then that, um, again, be careful where you leave your, lead your wife. Be careful where you leave your husband because it impacts both of you. Verse 3, But Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thine heart? Now, I'm not necessarily real good at this. I believe that Peter was the pastor of First Baptist Jerusalem. And he asked a number of questions. And everybody focuses on the one, why have you lied? But his first question, his first thing that he says is a, he has, is, a, is a different question in a way. He says, why uh, has Satan filled thine heart? Now, why is it that Satan fills the heart of people? It's because they're not saved. Because when we're saved, the Bible says, ye are sealed for, to the day of redemption, and that block is there, that seal is there, and Satan and his imps cannot pass it. Now, so why had Satan filled Ananias' heart? Because he was lost. He was a fake. He did not have the real deal. And so it was open. Now, I also will say this, and I never really noticed this until I started studying it. Who else was filled by Satan? Judas Iscariot, right? Well, it says that he was too. Right? Now we often, you know, Mary Magdalene, of whom seven devils were cast out, didn't say, it didn't say, it didn't say Satan, but it did say Satan was in Ananias. It doesn't say the spirit of Satan, meaning just the general attitudes of Satan. It said Satan was in his heart. So you're dealing with a lost man. Now, good thing to remind you of: you be sure, be sure, be sure that you have what you think you have. Because perhaps Ananias thought he was saved. Perhaps Ananias was deceived. But huh, he wasn't. He, was, he did not have the real deal. But, Ananias, but Peter said, Ananias, why has Satan filled thine heart? To lie to the Holy Ghost. So he said, I'm saved when he, not, when he was not. He was saying, yes, I felt the Holy Spirit when he didn't. You know what? You need to think back to the time the Lord saved you and be sure the Holy Ghost was there. That He was making it real to you. That a, a simple decision to follow Christ, you know what? That's not salvation. When He breathes into your life, huh, your soul, and you become a living creature spiritually, that is salvation. That is being born again. So, we find the answer to Ananias' why, why he was filled was because he lied. Why? I mean, because he uh, lied, 
The reason he lied was that he was filled with Satan. And that's the reason he lied to the Holy Ghost. And to keep back part of the price of the land. Now at the end of this uh, verse he asked another question. Why did you keep back the price of the land? Why did you keep part of it back? Now we'll see in a minute. Peter said it was yours. You could have done whatever you wanted to with it. So why did he keep back part? He was lost. That's why he kept back part of it. You know what? When these questions come up, it's a good thing to answer them. Why did he lie to the Holy Ghost? Because he lied. Because he was lost. Why, why did he keep back part of the price of the land? Because he was lost. That's the why in the story of Ananias. He, he was not a saved individual. And because of that, he lied and he lied and he lied. Uh, verse 4. He asked another question. Whilst it remained, was it not thine own? Sure it was. We have possessions by the power of God, by His by His grace and mercy. There are things that we own, and it's by God's goodness. And after it was sold, was it not in thine own power or thine authority? You could have done with the money every, anything you could have. <laughs> yes, it was under His own, own authority. Why hast thou conceived this thing in thine heart? Now he comes back to the spiritual and he says, why have you done this? Why, why, what does it mean to conceive? It means that you uh, bring two things together and life comes out of it. Why have you conceived in this heart? Now Ananias' part was getting this idea that the conception came from Satan himself. Why? Because he was lost. That's a good question to ask ourselves this morning. Why do you do the things you do? Very important question, ain't it? Uh, and so we, uh, Peter uh, asked a number of questions, and most of them, you can come down to it, is that he was lost. And verse 5, Ananias never gets the opportunity to answer any of those questions. And Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and gave up the ghost, and great fear came on all them that heard these things. Now, a lot of people will say Peter killed Ananias. No, he did not. Number one, God took his life. And number two, he died at the truth. He died hearing the truth. When the truth jams you in the face, it sets you back. When you know that there is nothing to be done if God doesn't intervene, it will knock you in the face. That's why free will doctrine, when we find out that the free will of man is not what it is, it will knock you down. It will cause you to just cry on the mercy of God. Me and Brother Junior was talking about his lesson and about the energy of Satan as he comes out of hell after that 1,000 year reign. I mean, yeah, the reign uh, of Christ. And when he comes out, he's back to his own tricks. You know why? Because he thinks he has free will. He thinks he can do it. And, and so we see the same thing is here. He falls on his back. He's out. He's dead. And the young men arose and wound him up and uh, carried him out and buried him. And it was about the space of three hours after when his wife, not knowing what was done, came in. Now you be careful of what you don't know. He did not, she did not know what was done. She didn't know what had occurred. So, the things you don't know, you be wary of. If you aren't assured of your salvation, you be wary of it. You, if the reality of hell has never hit home, you be wary of it. You, you be concerned about it. If you don't, uh, if you don't know how sinful we really are, you be wary of that thing. She stood in ignorance. In verse eight, and Peter answered and said, "Tell me whether you sold the land for so much." Now she's given a question too. 
What did you sell the land for? Now, I don't have any idea of what they sold the land for, but just say it was $1,000, and somebody came up to you and said, what did you sell the land for? Now, what Ananias did, he, he just say he sold it for 1000 he told everybody else he sold it for 800 He kept back part of that for himself. Come in, Sapphira, did you sell it for 800 bucks? Oh yes, that's what we got out of it. You know what she did? She agreed to a lie. We better be very careful that you, uh, when, that you do not agree to a lie. Now, each of you that have been here for a long time, remember the gentleman that used to sit right here, and he had long hair, and his wife sat beside him. Again and again and again, he wanted me to tell him he was saved. And I would say, and use his name, Pat, I cannot do that. I cannot do that. I cannot do that. You know why? To do so would have been a lie. Me and Donna have been married 28 years. I don't know whether she's saved or not. She's got some good fruit of salvation. She's followed the Lord the majority of their life. But if she came to me and said, Larry, am I saved? I don't know. Right? I, I don't know. And, and, and so we see that when you agree... Sapphira had the opportunity to say, No, we sold it for a thousand, and Ananias lied to you. But she did. She went along with it, and she gave her life for it too. Acts chapter 20, just a little further over. Acts chapter 20, we read of another liar. Acts chapter 20, verse 8. We're going to begin reading in verse 20. Paul says, but the but I mean Peter says, but Peter said unto him, Thy thy money perish with thee. Now I will throw something in here. Notice that all these lies are about money. These two sets of lies are about money. Now, if you know the story, what is this man's name? His name was Simon the Sorcerer. He used witchcraft. In fact, the Bible says he controlled a whole town by witchcraft. Do you realize this morning how real witchcraft is? And it's in the modern day. It's right now. I would easily say that there's at least a coven in Dover, Tennessee because they set them up just like we would map out an area to, to plant churches. They know what they're doing. It is a very big reality. It didn't end with the apostolic day. It's still going on today. There's witches wherever you look. And so we see, we see that this was Simon's occupation. Half the town got saved. The gig was up as the old saying goes. And the Bible says, and he was saved also. Now I'll present to you, that's what he told people. But his fruit did not bear it out. You know what that is? That's a spiritual lie. How many spiritual lies do you think you've told yourself? Now, you may be assured of your salvation. Uh, I hope you are. The Lord has assured me of that uh, time and time again. And what a joy it is when He does. But I've told myself spiritual lies. Oh, you're near the Lord. Oh, the only reason your prayers aren't affected is because, you know, God is sovereign. And He ain't going to necessarily do something just because you want it. And He's not. But if your prayer life is messed up, and you don't feel the Holy Spirit when He's near to you, it's a lie to say that you do. If you get nothing out of that blessed old book when you read, don't lie and say that you do. Because it's a spiritual lie. 
It is a spiritual lie. And so we see then that Ananias was, I mean, uh, Simon was this kind of fellow, and he begins to show his true character. And what I always find about false believers, you watch them long enough, and they'll show themselves for who they are. And even the ones that, you know, very good at it, they last about three years. And then they move on. That, that's the extent of their spirituality. So it says, But Peter said unto him, Now, let me catch up one more time. So we have this false believer. It says that he left with Peter and he wanted to follow uh, the apostles in their teaching and preaching. And, uh, and Peter cast out a demon. He cast out a devil. Now, Without progressing too far, I'll say that that is an apostolic gift and it died with the apostles. However, we can ask that God would remove the demon. We can ask that God might, in His sovereignty, cast out a devil because you know if we believe He's sovereign, He can do that, right? But you know what has to happen prior to that? We have to admit that there's a devil there. How would you this morning like to go before God and says, I know, I know this, I know this child of mine is demon possessed. Could you please pray for her? Brother Larry, could we bring the church together and lay hands on them? I know there's a demon in him. You know why we don't? It's because we're too proud. You say, well, that doesn't go on anymore. Well, that's funny to me. <laughs> How many times did they bring children before the Lord and ask that the Lord would cast out the demon? Do you think children has changed? In fact, the Bible says things will wax worse and worse, so the only conclusion that I can come to that there would be more demon possession today than there was back then, right? And so, the problem with us is this. We don't have, we don't, first of all, we don't have the spiritual discernment to see it. And secondly, if we did see it spiritually, we sure wouldn't come before the church and, and say, this child is, is devil-possessed. Can we bring it before the church and pray for them? And you say, well, I don't know uh, what, what a sign is. Well, I'll give you a big one. Self-destructive behavior. One of the demons that was cast out of a child, what, what did it say? He cast himself many times into the fire. In the modern day, how many people have you heard cutting their self? What say about the, the, uh, the maniac of Gadara? And he cutteth himself. He scratches himself upon stones. You know what? If my girl uh, started tracking up or cutting whatever they call it now, I would say, well, that, that young is probably going to be Now I can say this. Because she's mine and I'm casting stones at anybody else. I fully believe Anna was demon possessed. And she's mine and I can say that. You know, probably most of you said, well, you know, Anna wasn't that bad. Well, number one, I knew her better than you did. And number two, I have the courage to say it. Right? Oh, Mayor, Amen. And so we see then that that in, the, in that day, lying will do no good. Saying, "Oh, that don't happen anymore." Is a spiritual lie. It does you no good. That can't happen in my house. Is a spiritual lie, and it does you no good. Saying that that's an impossibility in the modern day is a spiritual lie, and it will do you no good. That's what we need, need to understand. So we find we're up to date with, the, with uh, Simon the sorcerer. He, uh, he, he had uh, Peter had cast out demons and now he wanted to cast out demons. And he, he says, I'll give you money if you show me how to do it. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perish with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither par part nor lot in the matter. Now here I believe that Peter is starting to say, Okay, 
I'm dealing with a lost person. Because he said, you don't have a portion in this. You, you, don't, you don't have an understanding of even what's going on here today. You don't have an understanding of the situation. But Peter said unto him, Thy money perished with thee, because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter. Why? For thine heart is not right in the sight of God. Now, when we think about God, Jehovah, we all see this and understand when He looks down from His lofty home above, why don't He wipe us out with one moment? You all know this. The blood of Jesus Christ, right? He looks down and sees the sacrifice of His dear Son. And He don't see our filthiness and our ungodliness. So He withholds His judgment. And we find here that He says, you don't know God. Thou art not right with God. So God from His lofty home on high looks down and He sees Simon's sin. He says, you're not right with Him. You're, you're, you're not in this situation. In other words, Simon was a spiritual liar. He was lying even as it is right now. He was not telling honest truth concerning his spiritual uh, condition. Verse 22 Repent therefore of this thy wickedness. Now what was his wickedness? Was it simply the fact that he asked, Can you give me power to cast out devils? No. He, the sentence before, I, I'm no English scholar, but the this is a generic pronoun and it always refers to the, the noun that was just above it. Right? That... Switch back to third or fourth grade with me. And the last thing that was mentioned, you don't have a lot of part in this matter. He had a missing part. And that part was salvation. That part was true redemption. That part was an experiential time with God. And he didn't have it. You don't have a lot or part in, the, in this whole matter. You've told a spiritual lie. You're in a condition that is not of saved people. Repent there, therefore of this thy wickedness and pray God if perhaps the thought of thine heart may be forgiven thee. For I perceive that thou art in a gall, gall of bitterness and this is the clincher in the bond of iniquity. That is why I say Simon wasn't real. Because you know what? I get in a bad shape. Have you ever been in a gall of bitterness since you've been saved? I have. But I do know this. I, I, I wasn't in a bond of iniquity anymore because the chains had been broken. I had been loosed. I had been set free. But we find here Simon is still in that entrapment to iniquity. That entrapment to his natural nature. That born nature with the sin of Adam. He was still trapped to it. And many, many people are today. They're in churches. They're in sovereign grace churches. And they've never had experiential salvation. And they remain in the entrapment of iniquity. You know why? They get out of the wills of the Lord so much. You know why they still have sin in their life? This sister was telling about some of her neighbors today. Bond of iniquity. Because He will loose you and set you free. And so we find, we find this morning... That you can be lied to. <coughs> Somebody can lie and say, let's just say this prayer together. Somebody can lie to you and say, all you need is baptism. Some people can lie to you and say, you can live like hell and you have that prayer back yonder and that's all you need. That is a spiritual lie and it is sending thousands to hell. That's a lie. Now the problem is this. You have the courage. You see some of that mess going on and say, hey man, you're a liar. You're setting these people up for destruction. You're a liar. Hard to do, ain't it? 
What about when we lie to ourselves? Might as well be honest. We're, we're, are you as close to the Lord as you were when you saved your soul? Be real honest about that. You don't have to answer me, but you were answering the Lord. Are you close to Him? Are you near to Him this morning? Now, if you're like me, you have areas in your life that you were cold and indifferent and you have areas in your life that was in nearness to Him and you have areas in your life that were kind of mediocre. The Bible calls them lukewarm. And you already have other times where you were hot. You know, the Bible says on the day of Pentecost, fire came down. You know what fire does? <laughs> this is not rocket science. It makes you hot. They were hot for the things of God. As a result of the coming down of the Holy Ghost. But I bet there was times later we do know in the lives of Peter. A little bit later, he was adding that old Judeal, Judeal laws back in. You can't eat with that one. You can't eat with this one. And the Bible says Paul was stood into his face. You know what Peter was doing? He was lying. So if Peter can do it and was an apostle among apostles, we can lie too. Go me the Gospel of Matthew chapter 7. Sometimes we have to dig very deep to find the root of the matter. Sometimes we have to dig very deep to find where the law, I mean, excuse me, where the lie is at. Acts chapter 7, verse 22. The Bible says, the Lord Jesus Christ preaching from the mount, Many will say to me in that day, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name, and in thy name cast out devils, and in thy name done many wonderful things works. Now the answer to that question is no, no, no. But you know what? They believed it. Someone had told them a lie. Somebody had told them that this is what you need to do. Have we not prophesied? And, and you know what? That, that word prophesy carries two different meanings. Number one is preaching. That's to prophesy. Number two is, oh, I believe the Lord will come back on November the 4th, 1914. Charles Taz Russell's uh, famed prediction. You know what it was? It was a lie. It was a spiritual lie. You know why? Because the Bible says, no man knoweth the day nor the hour when the Son of Man returneth. And so, he was telling a lie. And these people did too. Now I want you to see that at this point they're standing by in front of the throne of God. And again, who did I say no you were lying? God knows when you're lying. And it's all over with. That, that bravado is gone. They no longer can say, hey, this is the way it is. This is the situation in which I stand. It becomes a lie. It becomes a very obvious lie. So we have to go back. How did they get to this point? Go back and read to verse 16. You shall know them by their fruits. Do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? So people who say, oh yes, I am saved. I was saved way back in, in 1970 and, and Brother Willard uh, Smith came to me and together we said the, the sinner's prayer. But since then, I've lived like a dog. I've had 16 husbands. And I have, I, I, I've laid around with another one. And I've not been to church since that day. You know what that is? That's thorns. You know grapes? You know where grapes grow? They grow on a vine. You know where blackberries grow? 
They grow on a, on a bush with briars on it. It's never the other way around. It's always that way. And God's people will follow a pattern and the lost will always follow a different pattern. That's how it will always be. There's no sense of lying about it. There's no sense of, of sugarcoating it. You know what? Uh, one thing that uh, gets me today, it, instead of saying someone's just lost and they need Christ, the new catch term of the 2000s is a non-believer. You know what they are? They're lost. You know what they are? They're sinful. You know what they are? They're ungodly and stand in need of an experience with grace. They're not just a non-believer. But man, we code it down to something that's sweet, not too offensive. And can't, uh, but what we see is they're lost. Verse 17, even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but uh, a corrupt tree bringeth forth not evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bringeth forth good fruit. Every tree that bringeth not forth good tree fruit is hewn down and cast into the fire or into hell. So we see that as a, as a problem. We see that as not being real. Now remember the statement, Lord, did we not prophesy in thy name? And you know what? They may have had a few good fruits. So, while this is a symptom, it is not the root. While this is a symptom, it's not the problem. Now, go back with me one more time, all the way back, uh, I think it's to verse 12, but let me look. Go with me uh, back to verse 13, and you will find the, the root. Enter ye in at the straight gate. For wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be that go in there at. Kind of kind of eliminates things, don't it? Straight is the gate. Just a little narrow way. You know, this is the thing. We have double doors back there at the sanctuary. Most of us have almost never seen both those doors open. But if we did open them, we could get out a whole lot of people. Or conversely, we could get a lot of people in, right? You can get a lot of people in saying all you need is baptism. You can get a whole lot of people in saying, all I want you to do is to repeat this prayer with me. All I want you to do is to join this church and give a little money. But dear friend, that's a broad gate. That's way too inclusive. It is a very narrow gate to say if Christ don't intervene, you're on your way to hell. It is a very, very narrow gate to say God alone speaks lies. It is a very narrow gate to say I think it's 2 Corinthians 6. Maybe it's 14 or 1 Corinthians. For God, for the Lord had placed some in the church. Not everybody. He's placed some. So when you're saved, that doesn't put you in the church. God puts you in the church. Right? God places you there because of His mercy and His grace and His kindness toward us. God has placed some in the church. So we see that it's an action of God and not an action of man. And that's why this truth is hated so not much. Because straight is the gate and narrow is the way which leadeth unto life. And few be there find it. Beware of false prophets which come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly they are, they are ravening wolves. 
You be cautious of some people. All you have to do is be baptized. You be very careful of them. And what did I say at the beginning? How difficult it's going to be is that you are a spiritual liar. Very hard to do, ain't it? Number one, it does. It, it, it's going to stir up some strife. It's going to stir up some contention. But what's the better? You want their blood on your, your blood, their blood on your hands at the day of judgment? That is what the Bible teaches, is it not? Very sober man. So, are you a spiritual liar, or are you telling the truth? Is all well today, or do you need some help? Is all well today, or are you close? Last place, the Gospel of Matthew, chapter number 25. And we're going to look at very quickly, very familiar verses of Scripture. So it won't take long. Matthew 25, verse uh, 15. The Bible says, And to one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to every man according to his several ability, straightway took his journey. Now, what ability did he give you? Now, I will say this. He, he gave ability to his servants. Now, you say, well, Brother Larry, I can't do nothing whether well, you're calling the Bible a liar. It doesn't say salvation. And on that note, what are servants? When we had slavery in the United States, how did you get a slave? Right? That's how you, that's how you got a slave. You bought him. And you know how you became a servant of the Lord Jesus Christ? He bought you. Not the other way around. You didn't invite Him to buy you. He bought you and says, you know what? I'm going to buy that one. That one's mine. And He paid the cost on, on, the, on the cross of Calvary. And He bought you. Now, I'm not sure about this one servant. I do, I do know that He was cast out. I don't know if He was a lost man or not. Uh, in two of the Gospels, and I, it's my lack of understanding, I'm not calling the Bible a liar, certainly. I just don't know. Because one says he was cast into outer darkness, and some said he wasn't. Maybe it's two different events. But at any rate, he gave them what he knew they were able to handle. Verse, seven, uh, verse 19, and after a long time. You know when the Lord Jesus Christ is coming back? After a long time. And after a long time. Uh, and so it don't get me discouraged when I don't see the Lord each morning. And after a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoneth with them. Now this is the part good sovereign great gracers don't like. <laughs> but He will reckon with you. You know what reckon means? It means going over the account line by line by line by line and saying, okay, Larry, I saved you on in June of 1981. What did you do for me in 81? What did you do for me in 82? Uh-oh, look what you were doing in 85, 86, and 87. That don't look like the Son of God to me. You tell me about that. And we always will say, oh, it's all, all, all under the blood. Well, the penalty of sin is under the blood, but you will get an account. You will give an account. And so I'll have nothing to say for 86 and 87. All I can say is, Lord God, I'm sorry. I wasted the time that you gave me. Uh, I wasted opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to speak the things of Christ. It was a big waste. Lord God, I'm sorry. What else can you say? What else can you say? And you know the story. The one with five, he went out. He gained five other. But you know what? To do that, 
He took some risk. And that's the problem today. We're not willing to take any risk. You know what? The Lord's blessed so much the freedom of speech we presently have in our nation. We've not really been bothered with this. A couple of times it's like, no, you're not going to do it here. But what about the risk and driving 150 miles one way simply to preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ? Donna says, I can't drive. People can't drive. They make dumb mistakes. Now, of course, I always drive correctly. But is there a risk involved? My neat risk, would you say? Now, on the flip side, what if they say you're not going to do it, and if you do do it, we're putting you in jail? Kind of ups the ante, don't it? But if you're going to serve Christ, you do have to put it at risk. You do say, you know what, the Lord gave me this life, every breath that I take, every move that I make, it was granted by the sovereignty of God, and I'm going to lay it on the line, and I'm going to preach the glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, again, you know the rest of the story, the two got two. The one digged in, digged in the earth and, and hid it there, and came, and you ever thought about when he dug it back up, When you bury something and you dig it back up, what is it? This is not rocket scientist. It's dirty. If you point, put a coin in the ground and you dig it back up, it's dirty. It's been in the muck and the mire of this world, this earth, and when you pull it out, it's dirty. And can you imagine one little feeble thing saying, it's dirty, but here it is. Now that's the one with the one talent. That's the one that the Lord may be saved, but they live like dogs the rest of their life. And, and listen, if you're in that situation and you're saved, but you're living pretty much the way that you want to, you're out in sin and you're doing what feels good to this flesh, you know what? You're going to have a very short life according to the Word of God. But when you stand before the mighty Creator of all things, and one little dirty tact, what shame and a disgrace that's going to be. I want to be casting crowns one day, don't you? I look back on my life and I feel so miserable. But if one thing I've done would be pleasing of the Lord, I'd cast it down before him. You say, oh, Brother Larry, you know, you, you, you've been a preacher 22 years. Uh, you've pastored, but you know what? How sincere was most of that? Because now this is the other thing you've got to think about. It's going to be tried in fire. And the days that were halfway done, I will be accountable for. The days that I preached in anger, and yes, I have. Hope most of those days are behind me, but can't say even that for sure. You think they were edifying to the Lord? Probably not, right? At least I can admit that, that I, I've done that. So what? What, what is? What? What is it that we're going to stand before you? What lives have we told? Oh, everything is good with me. Everything is just marvelous. In regards to talents, one last thing, and we're going to close. If he's give you five, and you say, oh no, I've never been called to preach. Oh no, I'm not going to do that. It's a spiritual lie. And you will be accountable for it. Rest assured. So if he's give you something to do, get it off your seat. Thank you.